Let's pray. God, um, we thank you for who you are and for your unique, wonderful call in our lives. Help us be open and available to what you want to do in us, through us, and for us on this unique day. And, and I pray now, God, you'll help me get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life for each of the followers that are here and help each person hear exactly what you need them to hear, regardless of the words that come out of my mouth. We love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for the opportunity to worship together in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, what does it mean when a pastor holds up a clock? Absolutely nothing. Doesn't mean a thing. Um, just in case you were wondering. But we are going to talk about time today. And we, uh, one of the things that we think of as time is, yes, it passes. You know, we say the phrase, um, wow, that, that really went quickly. That just flew by. Um, and we, we reflect on, on the meaning of the time that we're given as a gift. And, and one of the great things to me about the Christmas season as, as we go through, you know, it's like we, we walk through this time, is that it's really hard to avoid Jesus. I mean, it's impossible really to avoid him. I mean, he shows up in our decorations. When, when somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus puts Christmas tree lights on their trees, they're, they're, it's a symbol of Jesus is the light of the world. That's what it means, okay? Um, or um, when we, when we um, listen to music, you can't help, if you're listening to Christmas music, um, some of it's gonna filter in, it's gonna be about Jesus. Um, parades, everything else. Jesus shows up in movies as well, especially if we have an eye to see. I mean, Jesus shows up in the Miracle on 34th Street. He's there in Elf, in the Grinch who stole Christmas, and of course, during Peanuts, very overtly. Jesus is everywhere. And by the way, we call it Christmas, right? It's Christmas. It's his holiday. It means it's natural for people to ask questions about what, what is the meaning of Christmas. And if they're going to ask, what is the meaning of Christmas? Well, they're going to ask what is the meaning of Jesus Christ? What difference does he make in my life, or could he make in my life? Um, now, I want, to, I want us to try a little experiment now. Um, just go with this for me. This is, this is an official experiment. What did that feel like? 15 minutes of silence when it wasn't expected? I mean, it felt, it felt like it took an interminably long time, and you were actually wishing, please, pastor, go ahead and say something, because this, this silence is getting more and more uncomfortable. What if we'd done that for a minute? What would that have been like? But, but what about when you're doing something that you really love and enjoy? 15 seconds is nothing. Um, a minute is a blink of an eye. Time really passes by quickly when we're in the middle of something that, that we are appreciating. And our time matters. I mean, we say the phrase, time flies, and so it does. Um, like, it feels like it was just July, and here we are saying, nope, it's 28 more days until Christmas. That is 672 hours, 40,320 minutes from now, Christmas will be here, so get busy, right? Okay. Now, Advent, the season of Advent, which is preparation for Christmas, reminds us of how significant and precious every moment in our life is. Time matters, and so does the timing of things matter. For example, um, how many of you would think it would have been a really great idea to have declared you were going on a diet the day before Thanksgiving? Great idea? Awesome. Um, I mean, I, uh, we wait for time to pass, and we anticipate things. Like, I don't know about you, but I like to anticipate the Thanksgiving meal. It's kind of fun, uh, the lead-up to it. I remember one year when I was a kid, my family was hosting, and, and my mother had done a lot of the preparation work and getting ready, and, and, and my dad, his responsibility and contribution was to, to, as an, he'd make the appetizer, kind of like as people were arriving, there'd be, our tr family tradition was shrimp cocktail. Don't ask me how we developed that. And, and the boys, what we would do is we would, we would crack open um, some fancy nuts, not regular peanuts. They had to be fancy because this was the holiday. And we would put them in a fancy dish, okay, because it was the holiday. 
So we had peanuts waiting for us, and we had, uh, and we had uh, shrimp cocktail. And my mom was cooking most of the rest of the meal, so that, obviously that means she was doing all the work. Um, and, um, and, and we were going to eat lunch at about 1 o'clock, and um, every guest began to arrive about 11 o'clock, and it became apparent after some time that we weren't going to be eating lunch at 1 o'clock. And so we all kind of um, gathered, and the kids said, Mom, what's, what's going on? She said, well, you know the, the seven-pound turkey that I got for us? It's 17 pounds. We'll be eating around 5 o'clock. Um, and, and so this was back in the days when you couldn't just pop out to, to get a hamburger somewhere. Nothing was open. Um, that's the way it used to be, kids. Really, everything was closed. Not a thing was open. And um, so let me tell, let's tell you, every piece of shrimp was eaten. Every peanut was gone. And, and it was the most highly anticipated Thanksgiving dinner in the history of my family. It was, it was awesome. Um, or, you know, tomorrow morning, um, that group of us is going to get on a plane to go to Cuba. Would it be a good idea for us to show up at the gate one minute late after boarding had been closed, doors are shut, and the plane begins to pull away? No, that would be a really bad idea. Timing matters. In football, um, a lot of what's happening now is they do timing passes where the receiver um, hasn't, isn't even looking at what his quarterback is doing or what is happening for him, and the, the, the quarterback releases the ball without the receiver ever turning around and looking, and it's a timing pass. It's like they trust one another to be in the right place at the right time, um, and, and it, oftentimes it works. Um, I remember um, the first time that my... My family, the first Christmas my family had, and we moved to Florida, I was about nine years old, and um, I, I really wanted to be able to tell my friends in the northern tundra of Elburn, Illinois, um, that I went swimming on Christmas Day, okay? So it's like, I was pumped about this. I'd been planning this out for months, and when the day came, it was 38 degrees, <laughs> and the pool was like 55. And, you know, like I said, my family's new to Florida, and, you know, this just doesn't seem like an odd request from my parents at this point in time. They said, sure, Jamie, you can go swimming. Um, we're in Florida. And, and so and I went swimming, and I realized very quickly, I discovered that it was absolutely the wrong time to go swimming. It was terrible timing. It was awful. Now, Scripture teaches us that Jesus came at just the right time. Jesus didn't come any early. He didn't come late. God's timing for Jesus to show up on this planet was perfect. And we see that in God's Word in Galatians 4, beginning at verse 4. It says, But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman. You know, that's, that's important. Like, what does that mean? It means that, that it makes a difference because we have a God who is not just a little bit like us, but He's completely like us. He's fully human. So when the right time came, God sent a son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Now, Paul in the book of Galatians has just been talking about um, what the law was all about. And, and they said the law in the Old Testament was a teacher, a guide. The law could help us know the difference between right and wrong, but it couldn't help us do the right thing. Um, and the fact is, under the law... One of the things that we begin to understand is that we're all a mess. Why? Because when, when okay, when, when you, a limit is set, we human beings want to go right up to the edge of the limit, peek over, and see if it's really okay on the other side or if there's danger. When there's a law, a limit, we want to hit it. We want to go up against it. Um, and it challenges us. Um, and the reality for us, we're all a mess under the law. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And, and we miss the mark of God's full intention for our lives. Um, not only have I done plenty of lousy things in my life, I've also left a whole lot of good things undone because I was too lazy, too worried, or I didn't care enough. And the Son of God, Jesus, allowed Himself to be subject to the same law that we couldn't live out with all of its flaws. And he says, I'm the true and better way to abundant life and the gift of salvation. 
And so Jesus says in Christmas, he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to make a home with you, but not just with you. I'm going to come and make a home in you, and I'm going to claim you as my very own. And that makes all the difference. Uh, Verse 5, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Romans 5, verse 6 says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. In his birth, in his ministry, in his death, in his resurrection, Jesus was always right on time. In our salvation, as Jesus enters into our lives, Jesus has always been right on time. And now, because of that, we get to be sons and daughters of a a gracious father because Jesus, our brother, says, I'm standing with you and I'm saving you. Verse 6, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now, we would never cry out, oh, thank you for the law, right? Right? Our relationship with the law is is as a limit. It keeps me from doing something. But my relationship with a a gracious, loving, heavenly father means I can call him Abba, which means daddy, which means it's personal, deep connection that we're talking about here. And daddies want to hear from their children. And we have that privilege. We have that deep connection. Um, Whenever you wonder if God's listening to you, okay, and you're, cry, you're crying out with everything that's within you, guess what? God's listening to you, okay? Because he's your daddy, and he loves you, and he wants to hear from you. Psalm 31, verse 14 and 15 says this, But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying, You are my God, not the God, not a God. You are my God. And he says, My future is in your hands. And so we trust God with all of our time, with all of the the limited nature of what it means to be stuck in the reality of time. We say, God, my future is in your hands. My past is in your hands. My my, uh, complete life is in your hands. Verse 7, now you are no longer slaves, but God's own children. And since you are his children, God has made you uh, his heir. That is important that everything that God has, he wants to give to us because we're heirs of his. So the law is a teacher, a guide, but we need more than the law. We need a savior. And Jesus, um, in the New Testament, he's called many different things. Prince of Peace, he's called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? Emmanuel means literally God is with us. And that's who Jesus is. Uh, God is not just beyond, above, out there, the unmoved mover. Um, And Jesus doesn't just show up uh, to be uh, God with us. Jesus is God with us, literally. That's what we say. And Paul here is saying that that God isn't a slave master demanding our adherence to the law. Rather, instead, what's happening now, now we we have Abba. We have Daddy. We have relationship. We have connection with the living God, one who loves us, listens to us, and cares deeply about us. But why do you suppose this was the right time? I mean, why, why would we say, why, why would, would Paul say, this is the right time? Well, we can surmise and guess some things, um, like what was going on 2,000 years ago that meant this might be the right time? Well, um, Alexander the Great um, had conquered uh, much of the known world 300 years before that and had, had brought a common language and a common culture that, that made it much easier uh, to communicate all over the world. Um, there was also the, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, um, which meant that it was a forced peace, you know, it's like it was at the tip of a sword, um, but, but it meant that, that you were able to, to have good roads and, and communication and connection was much easier. Uh, there, there was a common language uh, meant that, that good news, all news could spread, but good news, the good news 
could spread uh, wide, widely as well. Perhaps it was because so many of the, the prophecies uh, had been fulfilled or that now was the time to bring them into reality. We can't know any of this for sure, but here's one thing we do know. We know that at just the right time, God used a pagan dictator, Caesar Augustus, to make a decree about a census that got Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem to fulfill a 750-year-old prophecy in the book of Micah. Chapter 5, 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, catch this, whose origins are in the distant past, rather cryptic, isn't it? It's about, it's about someone in the line of David who's greater than David is coming, someone who's, who's part of the, the past, the present, and the future who's on his way and is going to redeem all time in this moment, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. And this Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled. At just the right time, we know that God sent a star to guide wise men from the east to Jerusalem and then to the city of Bethlehem to see Jesus as a little boy. At that, Jesus came at just the right time. Shouldn't surprise us. I mean, after all, we see God's perfect timing um, throughout uh, God's word. For example, at just the right time, when Moses was a baby. He was floated down the Nile in a basket by his mother. At just the right time, Pharaoh's daughter came out to bathe in the river at the same time. At just the right time, Moses cried so that he'd be noticed by Pharaoh's daughter. At just the right time, when he was 80 years old, when he was 80 years old, God appeared as a burning bush and spoke to Moses about leading his people out of slavery into the promised land. And Jesus is the true and better and perfect Moses who leads us out of slavery to sin and death and into the promised land of the eternal life that begins now, here and now. Jesus moves us from the law into the relationship, and that's huge. That makes all the difference. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 has a lot to say about time and how we use it. It says, for everything, there is a season, a time for, for every activity under heaven. Verse 11 then says, God has made everything beautiful in its own time. Don't you like that? It says, he has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So eternity has a home in our hearts. Um, when we think that we're not made for this world, it's because we're not. When we think that we don't have enough time, it's because it's true, because eventually eternity is what we're, we're created for. And the older I get, the more intrigued I get by the idea, the notion, the reality of what eternity is. And amen, okay? And let's face it, I'm a lot closer to the day of my death than I am to the date of my birth in all likelihood. Uh, now, I'm 54, so love to be 108. That'd be awesome if I was in perfect good health. Um, but the reality is I'm probably closer to that other day than I am to the day I was born. And here's 1962 to question mark. Okay, and then what's in there? There's the dash, right? Dash. We've all, a lot of us have heard about the dash. That's what we do with our life. That's what we have the privilege of response to God's grace and how we live out um, what we're doing. But here's the thing. No matter what that question mark comes to an end at, the number of years that I'm given pales in comparison to eternity. And, and, and many of us have grieved greatly for people whose, whose question mark ended way before we thought that should have, right? And that's terrible. That's tough. That's tragic. But the reality is um, this life prepares us for eternity, because eternity begins now. And, and, and those dates are a blip on the screen of eternity. Um, so it's important for us. Now, here's the thing. In, in the Greek language, there were, there were two words for time. There was chronos, chronological time, right? Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. And there was kairos. 
And kairos was the word that's used here that says, at just the right time, at the perfect time, God showed up. God did his thing. And the reality for us is, is in our chronos, we have to have kairos. We have to have moments where we know that we know that we know that God has encountered us, has transformed us, changed us, and made us new. I mean, at just the right time, time moments are necessary. I mean, I claim my conversion, uh, my stepping over the line of faith in Jesus Christ, key kairos moment. But you know what? I had kairos moments before that too, because I needed, to, I needed these moments of God's grace uh, helping me be in the right place at the right time to hear the good news. And that took a lot of people's lives, the other people speaking uh, those kairos realities into my life um, at just the right time. At just the right time, God shows up for us. Okay, when, when I remember um, when, um, when I was 17 years old, um, I, I was thinking I was pretty far from God, but actually um, I was on the edge of being close to God. And, and at one point, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't received communion for a couple of years, and I didn't want to, and I was someplace where, where um, the message that I got in my head, it was, it was being done, and it said, Jamie, this is for you. Jamie, this is for you. That's a Kairos moment, okay? So I went forward and I received communion. And that was the way that, that God grabbed hold of me. That's huge. That's important. I mean, now, Kairos moments also have happened many other way, points along the way in my life as I was doing chronology. Many of you remember that, that one of the things I said to God was, um, you know, God, I, 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 I hear you calling me into the ministry, and I'm going to do anything other than be a pastor of a local church. And, of course, God laughed, but he let me, let me struggle with that for the next 14 years. It took me 14 years to figure out that, that no, I'm supposed to simply say, um, God, I, I, I'm, I'm done, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just I'm gonna put myself in your hands. And a month later, after I'd done that, uh, I met Denise. Kairos moment, right? Okay. I mean, every appointment, and in, in the Methodist church, we are appointed I mean, we, we don't get called by the church, but we're appointed by a bishop. And, and I think I've, I have to look back and I say, whether I thought so at the time, every appointment that I've received to a local church has been a kairos moment. And God's been in it. God showed up. Um, we are all in need of kairos moments in our chronos lives, okay? So I want you to think deeply about your kairos moments. What are the times where you know that you know that you know that God showed up and, and he blessed you, that he changed you? And here's the, here's the crazy thing. We can miss Kairos moments. We can watch them walk right on by us. I mean, but the question for us is, will we see when Jesus shows up for us at just the right time? But let's face it. Most people didn't recognize the significance of Jesus as he entered into human history when he came as a baby to Bethlehem and was born. Most people didn't see the significance of Jesus as he engaged in ministry. Most people didn't see the significance of Jesus as he was dying for us on the cross. Most people didn't see the significance of Jesus as he was resurrected. Most people still didn't see the significance of Jesus when the apostles stood before him and, and, and preached the message of good news. So often in the book of Acts, one of the things that we see is the apostles preaching with great power. And I love what it says. It says, um, it says everyone heard and listened. Um, some wanted to hear more, and a few believed. Think, think about that, okay? They're talking about they're proclaiming the one who's been resurrected from the dead, and a few believed. Huge. Kairos. Jesus shows up for us at just the right time in our lives, and he still does when we're paying attention. Now, think about this. Um, Fifteen seconds before I said yes to Jesus Christ was not the right time. Think about that in your own life. See, I wasn't ready 15 seconds for what was coming 15 seconds later and the power of that moment, and it changed and transformed my life. Here's the thing. There's an old saying that goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. When the disciple is ready, the Savior appears, and that makes all the difference, okay? 
Um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 2, for God says, At just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, uh, right, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. And that's true right now as much as it's ever been. This moment is important for each one of us. It could be a Kairos moment. And the question is given, what God has done for you, what is your responsibility? If God has saved you and claimed you as his very own, now, now what? Now what? This is the moment. And perhaps, um, perhaps you've been intimidated by the Bible, and you thought, you know, that Bible, that, that, that's such a complicated book, I really can't even bother to read that. I mean, I, 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 I want Jesus in my life, but I'm scared of that book. Well, well, maybe now is the time for you to say, you know, um, because I have a daddy who loves me, I can read his word and I can find out who he is simply by spending some time in it. And I'm going to commit myself to hanging out with some folks who are at least one or two steps further ahead of me on the journey by being a part of a small group who can help me with that. How huge that would be. Now is the right time for that change. Perhaps um, you've been wrestling with God for some time about serving in a particular mission or ministry. Um, and you've been saying, not yet. How many of you ever said not yet to God? Okay. You, you clearly spoke into your life. You heard something. You knew you were supposed to do it. And you said, not yet. Well, maybe now is the time to say, this is the right time. And God, I'm all in. I'm all in. I want this. M maybe you've been... You've been running for God and have been wondering when a good time to stop would be. Perhaps now is the time to let yourself be caught by the living God and wrapped up in his arms of mercy and love and receive the hope and the grace that he wants to, to pour into you. Perhaps. Whatever it is that your next step is with Christ, um, let this be your at just the right moment time. Because at just the right time, um, here's the great thing. In the midst of, of this gift, free gift of salvation that God gives us, um, remember, we're, we're promised uh, eternity here and now and there and then when we die, okay? And, and in the season of Advent, um, God makes all the difference for us. Um, but here's the thing that's, that's really wonderful, um, not only does God save us and promise to be with us here and now, um, but one day God says, I'm going to make all things right. I want you to imagine that. I want you to imagine all things being right. What would that look like? I mean, it certainly look a lot different than the way that we do life today, wouldn't it? I mean, I'm looking forward to that day. Um, and here's, here's what we do. In Advent, we prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ by remembering and giving thanks for the first coming of Jesus Christ, which makes all the difference. See, the day is coming when the silent night is going to give way to the trumpet blast, and the reign of God will come in all of its fullness. The dead in Christ will rise, and death will be no more. Every single ounce of sadness and pain and sorrow and hurt that you've ever had is going to melt away. It won't be there anymore. There will be no more sickness, no more disease. There will only be healing, health, and wholeness. And the reality for us is that God will not only wipe away every tear that we have, one day there will be no more tears for us to shed because all will be perfect. We get this picture of that in Revelation 21, the, near the very end of the Bible, in verse 3 and 4, um, it's this beautiful vision of, of what, what it's going to be like in that day of the second coming. It says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. That, that's what the first coming is all about. God saying, hey, guess what? I, I'm so committed and connected to you. I'm going to make sure that I make my home with you. 
Jesus comes and he pitches the tent of his body with us and he says, I'm all in with you. Um, and that's what it is. But it's even going to be more fulfilled and perfect one day. Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these are gone forever. Forever. And yes, that we light this candle that, that shines in all of our darkness means that the darkness um, cannot extinguish it. The darkness cannot be overcome because, because one light is lit and it brings us hope. Um, and, and I think that's a really powerful reminder for us as we enter into this season. In, all, in the midst of all of our suffering, all of our pain, the light of Christ has come into the world for you and for me. See, but when the right time came, God sent his son to all humanity. Okay, but, but that's not enough. See, uh, at the right time, God sent his son for you. For you. Let's pray. Dear God, um, I thank you that you have come for all people, and I thank you that you have come for me. And I thank you that you've come for each person here. And I, I pray for us to, to see, be able to see those Kairos moments entering into the chronology of our life. Help us be open to the way that you want to speak into us, that you want to, to, you want to claim us, that you want us to, to make something uh, more of our dash. Because, Lord, no matter how many years we get, it's not very many compared to eternity. And so we thank you. We thank you for the living Christ who's come for us to make a home with us and to make a home in us. And we love you. Amen.